Hi friends, uh, welcome to Online Worship Trinity United Guelph, March 28th, 2021, and it is Palm Sunday. I hope you can hear the, uh, the birds singing, a few dogs barking, mine sound asleep, the pansies are, are coming out. Uh, one minute the sun is beating down and I'm hot, and the next minute I'm feeling a little chill. But it's uh, it's uh, a wonderful time of year as spring uh, is uh, is a part of our journey now. Uh, I'm so grateful this past week that we just had a spontaneous pop-up e email out to uh, folks, and we had about nine of us on the lawn. We'll do more of that in the coming weeks as we warm up. Uh, it's really important just to sit outside, no worries uh, like there are indoors. We can... Uh, sit safely, bring a lawn chair. So watch for more of that uh, opportunity. We are so blessed with a, a wonderful staff at Trinity, supported by our personnel team and our council. I just want to give a special thanks to Cindy, who uh, she takes care of the night checks. Ian, uh, we're enjoying you, Ian, as you uh, share in our custodian work and now some of our staff Zooms. Uh, our heart does go out to you, Ian, in the loss of your brother-in-law. It was quite sudden, and I know that you've been there for your sister. So uh, we hold you in our, our prayers, Ian, and we're, we're grateful for uh, the journey that we are, are getting to know each other, even during this pandemic. To the rest of the team, Wendelin, uh, for the gift that you bring to our children and youth and your care. To Andrea, uh, you have an incredible voice and... You guide us so beautifully and spiritually with uh, the music Sunday by Sunday. And to my colleague, Reverend Kalen, uh, it's been quite a journey. It's hard to believe uh, only another Sunday. And then on the 11th, after Easter, we'll, uh, we'll share in a dialogue and some fun. We'll have a little roast. But no, we'll have some fun reflecting on our, our 10 plus years together here at Trinity. So my friends, uh, on this Palm Sunday, I'd like to... Uh, Give thanks this past week, uh, over 350, I think, tickets of uh, roast beef dinner. Wow, what a team effort. Kathy Stevenson and her team, thank you so much. And as we look into this Holy Week, my friends, wow. Uh, we have an opportunity, which is really incredible. I think you can log into a Zoom. You just have to uh, go to the, the hookup for uh, registering. And we can Zoom with Harcourt and Dublin. I hope Three Willows joins us. We're going to have washing at the feet from home, uh, sharing and communion from your home. So have the bread and wine ready Thursday night, right from your home. We can all share together with Guelph United. On Friday, Good Friday, you'll have a video sharing uh, the powerful memories and the vignettes, the stories of, of that time at the cross with Jesus. And then the celebration of Easter. A special uh, video as well celebrating the resurrection of Christ. Well, as you know, I live in a neighborhood with dogs, so uh, don't be worried about the, the sounds. They're just sounds I'm becoming quite accustomed to working safely here from home. Let's uh, join together in our call to worship in these opening words. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Jesus is coming. Hosanna. He comes to us riding on a donkey. Hosanna. Open wide the gates. Hosanna. And singing together, he came riding in on a donkey. Or as today's version, uh, it says a colt. But uh, we're going to sing it together. Let's uh, gather for worship. Slow it. 
Hello. Do you know what the phrase roll out the red carpet means? It means something very special is going to happen. Sometimes it happens when there's going to be a big award ceremony and all the stars get out of the cars and they go onto the red carpet and there are people cheering and taking pictures and admiring their beautiful clothes. Something a bit like that happened on Palm Sunday. On Palm Sunday, Jesus entered Jerusalem. And on Palm Sunday, people celebrated Jesus. But they didn't put out a red carpet. Instead, they had palms. So they put palms down on the ground and Jesus was riding on a donkey and they put palms and their coats down and Jesus rode into Jerusalem. They were shouting Hosanna. Hosanna means save us. They wanted Jesus to save them. Do you know Jesus did come to help people that were in need or that were hurting? Many people recognized that Jesus was special that day on Palm Sunday. But Palm Sunday is a happy day and a sad day. Because now we know what history happened. And we know that at the end of Holy Week, that Jesus died. So this is a sad day for those of us that know what happened. But on Palm Sunday, the disciples and his friends and the crowds were happy to see Jesus. Others did not understand what Jesus was trying to do. They felt threatened by him. They didn't like the changes that Jesus was talking about. But the way Jesus acted, the way Jesus taught, and the way Jesus loved, that was what God wanted Jesus to do. So we have gone through this time of Lent, these 40 days of reflection, and now we're at the start of Holy Week. This is our time to get closer to God and to remember why we're Christians. And on Palm Sunday, Jesus came on a donkey into Jerusalem and the people were cheering him. So let's cheer him together today. I'm reading from Luke 19 verses 28 to 47, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. After Jesus said this, he went on ahead of them to Jerusalem. As they came near Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead with these instructions. Go to the village there ahead of you, and as you go in, you will find a colt tied up that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If someone asks you why you are untying it, tell them that the master needs it. They went on their way and found everything just as Jesus had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying it? The master needs it, they answered, and they took the colt to Jesus. Then they threw their cloaks over the animal and helped Jesus get on. As he rode on, people spread their cloaks on the road. 
when he came near Jerusalem at the place where the road went down the Mount of Olives, the large crowd of his disciples began to thank God and praise him in loud voices for all the great things that they had seen. God bless the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to God. Then some of the Pharisees in the crowd spoke to Jesus. Teacher, they said, command your disciples to be quiet. Jesus answered, I tell you that if I keep, they keep quiet, the stones themselves will start shouting. He came closer to the city, and when he saw it, he wept over it, saying, If you only knew today what is needed for peace, but now you cannot see it. The time will come when your enemies will surround you with barricades, blockade you, and close in on you from every side. They will completely destroy you and the people within your walls. Not a single stone will they leave in its place, because you did not recognize the time when God came to save you. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out the merchants, saying to them, It's written in the scriptures that God said, My temple is, will be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a hideout for thieves. Every day Jesus taught in the temple. The chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders of the people wanted to kill him. <laughs> Happy uh, Palm uh, Sunday and uh, welcome to the message entitled Climbing the South Steps with Jesus. Well, I've been outside on this beautiful day. I videotaped four times. Every time I was close to getting done, my dog saw somebody behind her house and I just didn't want the interruption of a dog barking. So I'm inside, kind of got a palm tree right next to me here. And I hope that you are, uh, I hope you're getting your vaccines, uh, still wearing your mask. I hope you're at least booked for your vaccine. And if you're younger, of course, you're, you're waiting your turn as I am. As uh, I think about Palm Sunday, I couldn't help but show you a picture today. And we mail out to a host of people who aren't on the internet a service every Sunday with the message. And this picture went with it. It might be hard to really pick up, but these are the south steps to the temple. You may recall, Jesus went up to the temple, turned the tables over. He caused havoc. He was fed up that religious leaders had turned the temple into a money-making system on the backs of the poor. And he wanted to end that. As we climb the steps with Jesus uh, this uh, Palm Sunday, I want to do some reflecting on what Jesus was really about heading to Jerusalem. Uh, this picture comes from Reverend Neil Young. He's uh, every day of Lent sending a picture from our Holy Land trip. Four years ago, a bunch from Trinity, St. Andrews, some from across Canada, we spent two weeks in Israel. I'll never forget sitting on these steps and thinking to myself, hey, Jesus walked here. Now, in 70 AD, they tore, destroyed the, the temple, the Roman powers, and it wasn't until the 20th century that they uncovered all the rubble to find these steps. Pretty cool archaeology. And it draws us closer to the time of Jesus. And when you think about Jerusalem, so if, you, if you've never been there, it's a walled city and there's entrances around the whole city. So however way that Jesus came into Jerusalem, he came through a gate and he climbed these steps to the temple. I joined uh, a scholar that I really appreciate, uh, an African-American, Michael Joseph Brown. He's a professor that captures uh, three questions I bring to the table today. What was Jesus thinking when he's going to Jerusalem? What in the world does Zechariah, the prophecy, have to do with this? And why does Luke, our storyteller today, downplay this trip to Jerusalem. And then fourthly, I ask the question on our own steps of faith, particularly during a pandemic, how are we being called to live out our faith? So the professor says it quite beautifully. 
Jesus is a mysterious figure throughout the Gospels. Luke gives us a distinct sense of who this Lord is. And curiously, Luke, he has nothing to say about palms. In fact, Matthew, Mark didn't either. Only John's Gospel recorded palms. So they're so important to us. I love them. They're at the church door. I hope you picked one up this week. The palms uh, watching the Blue Jays play this week. I saw them in Tampa. I went, wow, those palm trees. There's something magical about the palms. I, I love them. But Luke, Luke wasn't too concerned about them. But he was concerned about other things. But the professor does ask, why in the world does Jesus bother going to a Passover in Jerusalem? And here is what's very critical to understanding Jesus. You see, the Passover, my friends, is not the highest occasion in the Jewish religious holidays, but it's the most volatile and the most political because the Jewish people of Jesus' time are under the oppression of Romans. They're being squashed by them. The Passover reminds them long ago they were oppressed by the Egyptians. And God took favor upon them. And remember the blood that was put upon the posts of all the Hebrew homes? It saved them from the plagues. And sadly, the Egyptians were, were killed. But it is a story of emancipation, of freedom, that the Jewish religious community tells over and over again in the beautiful Passover. So the point is, Jesus went to a very political, volatile event. But somebody else was there as well. Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate uh, would typically be in his palace on the Mediterranean coast by Tel Aviv today. Beautiful uh, Mediterranean Sea. And picture uh, the distance, say, Toronto to Niagara-on-the-Lake. Pontius is out at Niagara-on-the-Lake. Going to travel to Jerusalem, about the distance of Toronto. It's not far in our time. But he travels there, not because he really wants to be in Jerusalem, but he travels because every Roman leader knows that when groups gather, there can be trouble. And the ragtag team of Jesus' followers were certainly trouble. And is captured well by a uh, historian, uh, Pliny the Younger, the Emperor Trajan, 111, 111 CE, wrote, listen to this, it's so reflective of our times. When people gather together for a common purpose, whatever name we may give them and whatever function we may assign them, they soon become political groups. We see it all the time. This week, thank God, people protesting the horrible hate directed towards Asians. We've seen it in the movements of Black Lives Matter. We've seen it in the LGBTQ2 community, people gathering together for freedom and justice. And we see it around the world, Myanmar. We see it in Russia. We see it in China. We see it home here in Canada. Put bluntly, give people enough space and time in the Romans idea They'll soon, they'll soon turn against you. Any oppressor knows this. Any tyrant, any dictator knows this. Thus, Jesus isn't afraid. And he goes to Jerusalem, no matter what the consequences. I admire that in Jesus. The courage to follow him is challenging for us all. Number two. What do we make of this prophecy, Zechariah 9? Well, here's where it gets a little confusing. Uh, Luke, like Matthew, they're trying to follow, the writers are trying to follow that this prophecy happening thousands of years earlier is coming true in the time of Jesus. The only thing is, the details are pretty confusing. In other words, John's Gospel, he doesn't even mention an animal or a cult. Luke tells us that Jesus entered the, the city by a cult. We have four different writers. They all have a different perspective of how this happened. We also discover through the professor, Brown, that 
Now, kings don't typically ride in on a colt in Hebrew stories. But what matters here in a mysterious way is that for the followers of Jesus, it's a triumphal entry. He is their king riding into the capital. And perhaps the Romans could care less about how he came in. They were more concerned about what these crowds were going to do and what they might be challenging of the system of their day. So a professor's point is the gospel writers, the church leaders of their time, they're doing their best to weave together historical aspirations and prophecy into the story we have today told in different ways. And third, most briefly, why does Luke downplay the significant, significant the political significance of this final trip to Jerusalem? Why does Luke do that? This is a very political moment for Jesus. Well, this scholar argues Jesus does it because Luke takes the thoughts back to the birth of Jesus from chapter 2, verse 14. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. For Luke, and for this writer, Luke is known as the healer. Each of the writers have a have a, a bias about, you know, a bias. And Luke is a healer. For him, Jesus is the ultimate peacemaker. He is the peacemaker. Luke surely knew that bringing religion and politics together is costly. And Jesus knew it very well. Well, as I climb along with you to the understanding of what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus in 2021? What does it mean to climb these steps of the South Temple? Well, we know, friends, that Jesus thought deeply of the synagogue, a gathered place for community, a place of learning. We know that Jesus did respect the temple, even though he disagreed with parts of what the temple was about. But most of all, I'd like to underscore that Jesus knew that faith takes us into the capital, into everyday life, no matter what that might cost. I find that in examples of I'm doing memorials and funerals throughout this pandemic. I have consistently people that say to me, I'm not religious, but I believe in something. They might even say, I'm spiritual. There's no church. There's no pews. I go into chapels. I bear witness to the faith that I believe in. And what's incredible, and I want to share with you, is often even before I've really said very much. I listen to people who share of their suffering, their sacrifice, as well as their love, their forgiveness, and even the power of grace. And I recognize in that, that God is mysterious, and this is happening beyond the walls of any church. And I am humbled by it. And I recognize as much as I love the church that I've been raised in, perhaps you have been as well, that we are called as Jesus to go through the city gates into the world, whether we're riding a colt or we're waving palm branches or not, to proclaim that as it says on our doors at Trinity with the rainbow message, God's love includes everyone. And that means that I dig very deep to understand, as a person of white privilege, what it means if a person is black, Asian, brown skin, what it means for them to live out their lives in a culture that's dominantly white. What does it mean as well for an indigenous person who has suffered the unbelievable experience of residential school life? and how difficult that has been upon their life and their culture. You know, it also uh, means for me, friends, that to recognize that 
racism is a part of the whole world, as noted in our Bible study this week. You know, there isn't a culture out there that doesn't have racism. It might be in Europe and Asia. It's here in North America. It's in all of us. It's not just in the police. And likewise with the uh, sexism in our society and what we're discovering about the military, we know it is not just the military. It's in religious organizations. It's in politics. This is a Jesus that challenges us to face honestly what is happening in our society in the ways that people are being oppressed and how systems oppress us. So I want to uh, close with this, my friends. This mysterious Jesus is with us. We gathered spontaneously on the lawn at Trinity because it was a glorious Tuesday. About nine of us sat on the Balsam Street side of Trinity. We sat safely in a circle and we expressed how we were doing and what we were looking forward to. And I have no doubt, I felt it, that Jesus was sitting with us. And I have no doubt that Jesus is sitting with you right now, that his spirit is guiding you up the steps to the temple, through the gates into our lives in the places that we go so that we might live out our faith, a faith that really transforms and makes this world a new and more compassionate place. May the shalom, the wholeness of God's love be with you this holy week. We have a very special week ahead. Might God bless you and keep you. Amen. No dog barking. I'm really feeling grateful now. Welcome to this service of communion on behalf of Trinity United Church. Jesus shared his meal with all kinds of people, doubters, believers, and skeptics, rich and poor, leaders and followers, scholars and fishermen, and tax collectors, palm wavers and parade watchers. He calls us to come taste and see that God is good, that there is enough for everyone, that there is another way. This is the table where all kinds of people from all kinds of places in all kinds of times meet. This table does not belong to the United Church or to this congregation, it belongs to Christ. And he is the one who promises to meet us here. This is the table where we can begin a journey, where we can make a turn, where we can be strengthened for the road ahead. So come not because you understand, but because you want to know God more. Come not because you love God a lot, but because you love God a little and you want to love more. Come not because your faith is unshakable, but because you could use some strength for the journey. Come not because you are already perfect and worthy, but because it is Christ himself who invites you to share in the feast. 
We understand that this bread and this cup is a symbol of the nurturing and sustaining presence of Christ with us each and every day. When Jesus gathered with his followers around a table, he lifted the cup and said, this is my suffering poured out for you. And when you drink this, remember me. And he lifted the bread and broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus said, this is my body. We are the body of Christ. This body knows what it is like to long for a hug, but not be able to get one when we need it the most. This body knows how to feel a hug through a window or a screen. This body knows what it is like to be afraid. This body knows what it is like to be loved out of its fear. This body knows what it is like to be hungry, but not able to go to the store to get food. This body knows the sadness of having enough food, but feeling the hunger of others. This body feels helpless in the face of injustice. This body is energized for activism to change the unjust structures of society. This body knows what it is like to lose a job when it needs it the most. This body knows what it is like to work in a hospital without enough protection. This body knows what it is like to be alone in a hospital, unable to have visitors. This body knows the joy of getting a phone call from anybody. This body knows what it is like to wake up in the middle of the night worrying. This body knows what it is like to fall back asleep and dream sweetly oblivious to the cares of the world. This body knows life in all its sorrow and pleasure, fullness and emptiness, eagerness and trepidation. This is your body. This is our body. This is the body of Christ. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of the people from God. Let us partake and be thankful. The body of Christ broken for you, and the cup of salvation poured out for you. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, for the gifts we have received this day and every day, we give you our thanks. Bless us now on this journey into this holy week. We lift palms today, but know that crosses mark the road ahead as well. May we know that whatever road we travel, we are always in your loving and compassionate presence. Bless us, we pray. Amen. Now may the peace of Christ be with you, the love of God surround you, and the Holy Spirit guide you in all that you say and do, this day 
and forevermore. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number 122 in Voices United, All Glory, Laud, and Honor, and we're singing verses 3 and 4. <laughs> 